Good evening and thank you for joining us for tonight's conversation, Black in the White House, co-sponsored by the Georgetown Institute of Politics and Public Service, known to many of you as GU Politics and the Blacks of. My name is Monique Wilson and I'm a junior in the college studying American studies with a minor in government. I serve as the editor-in-chief of the Blacksa, the first all-Black media group at Georgetown University. Founded in 2019, the Blacksa's mission is to provide a space for Black students to unapologetically express themselves in whatever medium that may be, music playlists, opinion pieces, or roundtable discussions. If you want to stay updated on our work, check out our website at theblacksa.com and follow us at theblacksa.gu on Instagram. Tonight's panel features four Black former White House staffers who have worked through several administrations. Minion Moore served as assistant to the president and director of White House political affairs during the Clinton administration. And she's the co-author of the book for colored girls who have considered politics. Ron Christie is an adjunct professor in the McCourt School of Public Policy, a member of Geopolitics Advisory Board and held multiple roles in the Bush administration, including special assistant to the president and acting director of the USA Freedom Corps. Jonah Van Den began her career in the scheduling office of President Bush Sr. and after working on the transition team, returned to the White House during the George W. Bush administration as advance and scheduling director for Lynn Cheney. Lastly, Marlon Marshall, a spring 2017 GU politics fellow and a McCourt School alumnus, served as special assistant to the president and principal deputy director of the White House Office of Public Engagement during the Obama administration. Our conversation tonight will be moderated by Joanna Summers, a political reporter for NPR and a fall 2016 GU politics fellow. Join in the conversation by using hashtag GU politics forum and tagging at GU politics. Joanna, over to you. Hi folks, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm so thankful that the Institute brought me back. I was a fellow in the fall of 2016, so things have certainly changed since then and I wish that we were all doing this in person, but I'm really excited to be with all of these folks today who I've met a number of through work and I'm excited to learn a lot from right along with you. Um, to start out our conversation, I wanna remind you that we're gonna be taking questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please use the Q&A function and we'll be going through those and bringing those in a bit later in the conversation. But to start, I get the privilege of asking the first question and I, I want to go to each of you on this one um, and just have you talk a little bit about what drove you to start a career in public service and how you got your start. And Marlon, since you're on my screen, I'm gonna, have you, I'm gonna go ahead and start with you. Hey everyone, Marlon Marshall. Um, thanks for joining us today. And more importantly, um, just thanks for all you guys are doing. Like I can, I can only imagine how tough it is um, taking courses online and, and everything that's going on in the pandemic and just know, um, you know, we're out here with you and just support you in whatever way we can. So I appreciate you joining. Um, I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, my mom was a teacher for 35 years in St. Louis public school system. My dad was a custodian in a suburban school system. Um, I went to private school from first to sixth grade where I was the only African-American kid in my class uh, and then went to a public school in the suburbs because my dad worked for that district. And I mentioned all that because early on, I saw the inequities in uh, public education. Uh, my mom having to use many of her own resources to uh, purchase materials to teach her kids uh, in the St. Louis public school system. And meanwhile, uh, we were in a wealthy, uh, predominantly white uh, suburban public school district that had a lot of resources, computer labs and whatnot. And that just felt off to me as I was a little kid. And I talked often to my mom about it. Uh, I went to University of Kansas where I majored in uh, communication studies, but started off as a, a computer science major and got the bug uh, by running for student government. And I saw there the change you can make uh, at, a, at a small level in the university, but we worked to uh, work with the administration to recruit more students of color to the University of Kansas. Uh, and that's where I got the bug. Uh, I always had that kind of itch in public service and knowing what was wrong and why school systems were segregated, why sc different schools got different resources, why I had to go into a white um, neighborhood in order to get the education I did. Uh, and that just always, I wanted to fix that. And so when I found students in it, uh, I switched my major, which my mom was uh, not happy with at the time, but today she's totally okay with it, uh, and ultimately got involved in, in campaigns. And so 
uh, shortly, a couple years after college, I started working on campaigns full time, worked for Kerry in 2004 and worked on uh, many presidentials up into 2016, where I got a chance to uh, work with the fabulous Mignon Moore, who's uh, I know going to go up in a little bit. Uh, and then again, worked in the Obama administration also. But that's how I got started. It all became for me with education and making sure that um, communities and kids that look like me had the opportunity no matter where they live. Thanks so much, Marlon. As a, an alum of the University of Missouri, I will try not to hold your Jayhawk roots against <laughs> you. I grew up in Kansas City, so we've got the Missouri thing in common. Uh, Mignon, how about you? Well, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. And uh, I am equally as delighted as Marlon to be here with you all. Uh, I know it can be challenging, but hopefully, you know, being at home, you have even learned more than being in the classroom. So hats off to those who have had to study from home. I actually got started uh, in politics in Chicago. I'm originally from Chicago. I, I worked on a very small mayor's race, Harold Washington. At the time, he was a Congress member and he decided, uh, well, the city of Chicago decided they wanted him to run for mayor. At that time, I was in college, and so a group of friends, of we went down to his office and said we wanted to volunteer. And so we thought we were going to be given this packet of information and how to do this, because we were all like young kids, just eager to help. You know, everybody was excited about getting him elected, but they gave us a table in the corner and told us, here you go. Then eventually they gave us some walk sheets and told us where they wanted us to walk and try to recruit people. And that's literally how I got involved. But I will say this to the young people that might be listening. One of the things that that race taught me was it really taught me about public service. Because at the time, there had never been a mayor that came out south where I lived. And so one of the conditions of working for him was to make sure that we were able to bring him out south. And that's when I really realized the power of my vote, the power of my work, the power of really working for a political candidate. Um, I was actually in corporate America when I started even volunteering for Hell Washington. I was playing my way through college and then I was working for this company called Encyclopedia Britannica. Most folks know it as Google today. <laughs> but, and you know, I listened to Marlon talk about the inequities and I saw that encyclopedia as something that we really needed in the, in the black community. So I worked with my company to lower the prices so that we can get that in our community. So I think I've always had it in my blood to just you know work in public service. Then I worked for um, the DNC and then on to the Clinton White House. And here I am today. Thank you so much, Mignon. Um, Jana Van Doon, you're up next. Well, thank you so much for having me. And, and this is really exciting. Um, again, kudos to you all for working online and, and trying to keep your education going during these really difficult times. But I'm so glad that you're here. So actually, your question is interesting because I think people go to public service for basically three different reasons. You go for patriotism, you go for experience, or you go because you were asked. So the first time I went to the White House, um, so I, so back up a little bit, I grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska um, and in the seventies. So if you were black, you, everybody lived pretty much in the same neighborhoods. Um, there were lots of us. And um, then as we were starting to move forward in our education, uh, my mother decided that um, she wanted to make sure that we had every opportunity available to us. Um, so she moved us across town, which at the time, you know, Lincoln, Nebraska is not very big. It's not even a million people um, moved us across town um, where so we could go to a, a, what she considered a better school. I'm not convinced that it was any better than any other place. Um, we didn't own a car until I was 22. We walked or took a, or we walked, took a bus or biked. And um, I woke up um, one morning, you know, I went to college. This is a horrible reason. Ron knows the story. I went to college because my friends were doing it. Um, you know, my destiny um, as a young black woman in, in Lincoln, Nebraska was, you know, you became a doctor, a lawyer, cleaned houses, or you were a teacher. And those were the, those were the places that you went. And the counselor said to me, I don't think you're college material. Um, so I was like, you're an idiot. So I'm like, oh, I'll go to school. i um, got a full ride to the College of St. Benedict, which is in St. Joseph, Minnesota, which is an all women's college. Um, and there um, really understood kind of the power around the world. But I 
didn't quite understand how things worked. I'd never seen a plane. I'd never seen highway signs before. Um, and I go to this place and they're all, there are these amazing books and amazing people with amazing ideas. And um, as a joke, I filled out a form. We didn't have fax machines. There was no computers, nothing. You had to do everything by snail mail. So there was a, a brochure for a intern White House, an internship at the White House. And I was like, how hard can this be? <laughs> it can't be that hard to get into there. And so I sent the form in, didn't think a thing about it. Um, and two months later, I get a call from some woman um, saying, hi, we have your resume. And I'd been, in, I, I'd been in student government, participated in sports and done all these things. And I had been accepted as a White House intern. And I thought they were joking. Um, so I make, and so I, I was like, oh my gosh. And I called my mother and told her, and then it dawned on me, like there's no way that I'm gonna be able to do this. Like we couldn't afford this. We, did, we didn't have a car. Um, miraculously, um, the Sisters of St. Benedict, um, um, I told them miraculously um, the next day there was $15,000 in my account with a note to say, pay it back when you, um, when you can. And I made my way to Washington and, and I wanted that experience. I wanted to be part of something great and amazing. I worked for George Herbert Walker Bush. Um, there was one other kid that looked like me um, at the white house. And we've all gotten this speech from our parents. You need to work harder, faster, bigger, better than everybody else. And my mother kept saying that to me. So, and I can out hustle anybody, um, but I worked as hard as I possibly can. Um, and it was never, for me, I, where some of you have had this big epiphany about um, the inequities in the world. I was so excited to be there and wanted to do the best I possibly could and, and, and bring as many people along as I can, you know, to tell them, because there are really, I mean, there aren't a lot of people like me, black, conservative, Republican women, I couldn't think of one. I knew all the, the black Republican African men, um, Shelby Steele, JC Watt, you know, those were, those were Ron laughs because he knows these are people that we've grow, that we've come to know and grow up with. Um, but for me, it was, and it, it was one of those moments of, oh my gosh, I, we have this huge opportunity. And I said this to Ron earlier, it wasn't that we had any type of platform, especially going back to work for Bush 43, we were a family and mm -hmm. they made sure when, when George Herbert Walker Bush lost to Clinton, they made sure that we had jobs. Um, they made sure that we were all okay. You know, did you have a place to go after the administration and, and that type of, um, camaraderie and care that they made me feel. And I, and I don't want to speak for Ron, but I'm sure he felt the same way. When we came back in 43, it was like, we were a family and you were there to do whatever you needed to do to help the family um, to move forward. Now I will say Ron and I were very good at sneaking in things here and there <laughs> um, when people didn't recognize what we were doing um, in, in certain events <laughs> for people doing things, but that's kind of, so that's kind of how I, I look at this. Again, it was an honor and a privilege to serve both presidents. Um, I couldn't, it's the best jobs I ever had. I loved working for the Cheneys. Again, it wasn't like you were working for her or for him. It was, and Ron knows, oh if one asked, you did it. It didn't matter who it was. And um, we were a family and that's how, and how that's worked. So thanks. And last but certainly not least, uh, Ron Christie. Well, good evening, everybody, and to all of the Georgetown community members and those from our extended family, Hoya Saxa to you. And I'm so glad that you all have had the opportunity to join us tonight for this very, very important conversation. So I got into politics in much the same way that Marlon did, right? I kind of looked around and I grew up in Palo Alto, California, and there weren't a lot of people who looked like me. And I remember in 1979, being a student of history at 10 years old, that the two-term governor of California was coming to my town. And I said to my parents, I said, Ronald Reagan is coming to town. And they said, we're not gonna take you. And I said, okay. So I got up my Schwinn blue two-speed, not one speed, two-speed bike. And I took my bike and I went to the Reagan rally for him running for president. And the Secret Service and, and the three of my fellow panelists will get this. The Secret Service took one look at me and like, black kid on a Schwinn two-speed bike, put him in the, front, <laughs> in the front of the procession. And I went to Ronald Reagan's rally in Northern California at a time when a Republican could win 
in California. And I went to Palo Alto Senior High School and I ran for student council and it was 1984. And my campaign slogan was put another Ron in office. And I won. <laughs> and that gave me the bug and that gave me the sort of Potomac fever uh, that I think that all of us have had throughout our respective careers. But I would say in, in short and in closing, there is truly, regardless of your skin color, regardless of your gender, no greater privilege than to serve your country and to have the opportunity to work and service in a cause greater than yourself. And I very much look forward to this conversation because I think from a Republican, Democrat, and everything in between perspective, I think the one thing that you'll hear from all of us tonight is our reverence for our country and the respect and privilege that we recognize that we had. And from any of my students who are watching, our class will be on Zoom on Thursday and not in person. And with that, I turn it back to you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ron. Um, I just want to put up another reminder. If you all have questions, please use the Zoom Q&A format and we'll be bringing some of those in live. Um, something that all of you sort of touched on is, you know, the parts of yourself that brought you to the work and the parts of yourself that um, kind of inspired you into public service. So I'm wondering if any of you have examples of ways in which your lived experience uh, informs something you're able to achieve while working in the White House. Well, if, if, if I may, you know, the one thing that I feel most privileged to have had the opportunity to do, and, and John has certainly touched on this, and we talked about this earlier today, you don't go into the White House thinking that you're going to be the black staffer. Mm -hmm. You go into the White House thinking that you're going to be the best staffer that you can be who happens to be of color. And I remember early on, it was my second or third day, and the vice president handed me a dear colleague letter for those of you who don't know, a Dear Colleague letter is a letter written from a member of Congress uh, to others asking them to sign onto a bill or to be a part of an amendment. And it was from John Lewis, it was from Sam Brownback, it was from John Lender, and it was from Max Cleland. And it said, Dear Colleague, every year since 1915, there's been an effort to have a Black History Museum on the National Mall. And we, in essence, are looking for you to co-sponsor this legislation and to be a part of this. And the vice president handed this to me and he said, get this done, Ron. I said, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And you can't really see it behind me. There's a, my departure photo from Dick Cheney. And, and when I got promoted to work for the president, he said, there's one thing that troubles me about your promotion. Who will take over making sure that this Black History Museum gets taken care of, Ron? And when I worked for the president, um, I kept pushing, I kept working, and I kept working with Congressman Lewis. And it was December 14th, 2003. It had passed the House uh, unanimous, well, almost unanimously. And I went to our chief of staff and I said, this is the first time we've had it pass the House. It's on the verge of passing the Senate. Can you ask the majority leader, Bill Frist, to pass this by unanimous consent? He's like, oh. We're doing Medicare Part D, we're too busy, there are too many other things going on. And he called me back and he said, come over here and tell the president yourself. And so I went and I told the president, I said, Mr. President, you've asked me for the last three, almost four years to take care of this. This is your opportunity to get it done. Would you call the Senate Majority Leader and have him pass this by unanimous consent? And this is John O'Neill's, cranky George Bush is not a person or a vidget that you want to be in front of. <laughs> it's like, so you want me to do what? I said, sir, I need you to call the Senate Majority Leader, ask him to pass HR 3491 by unanimous consent. He said, I'll do it. And he did it. And it passed. And I just remember sitting in the Roosevelt Room, watching Cicely Tyson, watching Representative John Lewis, and so many other folks just weeping in joy for something that has been pushed since 1915. And I thought, in my own small way, for being a White House staff, or I actually did something that will benefit others. And it's, it's something that chokes me up now. And I just thrilled to share that story with all of you. Mm -hmm. Can you all talk a little bit about what conversations about race were, were like in your work? I feel like we have had so, so many frank conversations this year in particular by virtue of the slate of current events we have. And it's changed the way, no matter if you're someone like me who's working in a newsroom or folks like y'all who are working in public service or folks who are working in the private sector, it's, it's just changed the tone of the conversation. And so I'm just wondering what's different versus, from now, now versus then. 
Well, I can tell you when I when I went into the White House, we were at the height of affirmative action. Huh. And it was, you know, we had affirmative action, we had welfare reform, we had the crime bill, we had all the things that we are virtually dealing with now in some iteration. But in particular, I remember the affirmative action debate that we were having because, you know, at that time, and I say this respectfully, at that time we were dealing with whether or not white men felt like they weren't being included in America anymore. Hmm. So, you know, we had the quintessential Southerners who were helming the White House at the time. So we really did have to have some vigorous debates about it. But one of the things that I think where we landed in, this is what happens when you're at the table and Ron and Jonah and Marlon can attest, every now and then you're in these rooms and you have to have the courage of your convictions when you are in these rooms and you gotta be willing to speak up. And so we knew that it was heading down a path that could be incredibly tricky, especially for women and people of color. So where we landed with it, of course, was the famous mended don't end it. Um, But that came as a result of black and brown people pushing to make it better and pushing so that, you know, we won't be left on the margins. And I will only say this, when I worked at the White House, there are a lot of times when you walk in those rooms when you really just don't feel like saying anything. Mm-hmm. But there is never a time where you should be silent when you know that it's going to impact people, not just people of color, but it could be poor people, white people. Could be, but if it's going to impact them, then you have to be willing to speak up. And sometimes it's just not popular. And that's the thing that I think I learned very early on. I probably was not going to be the most popular, but I was going to be the one that had the mm-hmm. convictions that I believe that were instilled in me and the reason why I wanted to be in that room in the first place. Uh, I was in the White House uh, from 2013 to 2015 and the second term in the Obama administration. Um, there were, prior to me joining some high profile um, black male deaths uh, by the police or by, um, you know, individuals. Um, And when I was there um, is when Ferguson happened. Mm. And I mentioned the years for a couple of reasons. One, I think the second term of the Obama administration, race was discussed probably slightly differently than the first term. Um, And, you know, I, it was it was a my experience in the White House was also working for the first black president in the United States, um, and that comes with a lot of everything, right? Like how you help the community. Um, there's just a lot of things that come with that, um, and so. But for me personally, when Ferguson happened, um, it was a very personal moment. That's Ferguson is a suburb of St. Louis. Um, mm-hmm. Mike Brown's uh, mom graduated a year after me in my high school. Um, and so the president asked me actually to go, um, you know, represent the administration at his funeral. Um, and when all the, um, when you see all the police presence in the streets following the uh, protesting or during the protesting, um, that was the moment where I, as a black person working for the first black president, felt somewhat hopeless being in the you know, White House, in the West Wing, in the um, Eisenhower building, watching your home on TV look like that and feeling like you can't just pick up the phone and be like, stop, you know? Um, and so I think that was an a, a interesting situation because then how do you take that and then... Um, or try to turn it into something that can make change. Um, I know that came from that. There was a commission the president put together where we had a lot of people who, um, you know, activists, um, police chiefs come together to talk about how to change policing. Um, you know, shortly around that, we launched My Brother's Keeper, an initiative focused on young men and boys of color, which I was uh, felt very proud to be a part of um, and help create the community challenge, which is working with cities and I think one of the things I learned a lot, which you hear often, but like being in the White House is real. It's like all politics is local. We can have the greatest ideas, but if you're not with the people on the ground and in the communities, 
it doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. And so we have to, um, and that's why I love my job at OPE, the Office of Public Engagement, because we had to figure out how do we, how do we make sure what we're doing is like out there and reflecting and that we're, it's a community conversation, not just us saying, we're going to go do this, but us working together with, with those that need it the most. Um, so that was a, um, uh, a life-changing experience for me. And I agree, like uh, it was an honor to serve um, President Obama, I'm going to serve this country. Uh, and, you know, I think that was the height of, uh, with all the racial tensions and issues and things that have happened in the country in the past few years. Uh, for me, that was a really, that was a moment where, you know, trying to determine like, as a black person in this position, how can I best help serve um, our country, but, but more frankly, you know, our people. You also have to remember too. So when, again, when we were in the White House for that second, for the first term of Bush, we had 9-11. So any discussions about race, um, any of those things were, were gone because it was, this was about all Americans. This was about how we were going to come together as a country and, you know, whatever happened after that um, in how we, we decided, they decided to govern, that's fine. But that, at that year or those two years from 2001 um, to 2003 um, had to be the hardest, toughest times to be at the White House, trying to figure out how you can, you know, you can affect change in certain ways, um, be in certain rooms to make certain decisions. But at that time, it was all about, you know, what had happened to this country. Um, and you saw this kind of, a lot of people really questioned, um, you know, what their part was, um, you know, in the administration. And I know I had a really tough time in 2002. And I think I woke up one morning and like, I can't be here anymore and I have to go home. So. And let me, let me echo what my three colleagues have said. As I also mentioned at the outset of our conversation, if you want to go in there and you want to work your hardest and do your best for the country and for the president that you're honored and privileged to serve. But for me, and I'm sure that my three other colleagues have probably had a similar experience. You walk in the room and oftentimes you're the only person who looks like you and you listen to the conversation and you're like, that's just not right. I just remember early on, we were talking about Bush's economic agenda and, well, how do we appeal to people of color? Oh, I know. We'll talk about welfare reform, criminal justice reform. And, the, and I'm like, all black people aren't poor. All black people aren't in jail. All black people don't have this monolithic existence. And I went to the vice president and I told him, I said, sir, I, I, you'll never just, I was at senior staff and this happened. And he said, so what do you think we should do? And I said, well, I think you should pull together a lunch and have people of color. I said, I'm from Palo Alto, California. Dylan Glenn is from rural Georgia. You know, you look at all these, Rob Woodson Jr. is from Wilmington, Delaware. None of us have the same experience, but it seems to me that people in this administration look at black people like they're black people. And you can't effectively govern as the president or the vice president, unless you recognize that there are more voices that need to be heard. And so I didn't want to be the black person in the White House. I just wanted to be Ron in the White House. But I think we can all recognize meetings and settings that we've been in, that if we don't stand up or if we didn't speak up, then that opportunity would have been wasted. You know, can I, can I, can I comment on that? Because, you know, that is often the dilemma for for black people that sit in positions of power or you know have to represent when they don't really want to lean in but you know i i fundamentally learned a long time ago that i first of all i can't out white white people i just can't do it <laughs> i can't do it but what i can do is set a bar for black people that we can all aspire to including white people looking at us so I always saw it as an opportunity to embrace and to educate, even though none of my jobs, I, I was in OPE, I was in political affairs, none of my jobs dictated that I had to be the black person. But what I always understood was that no matter what I did or said, in the end, I had to represent something that looked like me too. Mm -hmm. And so you know, a lot of times I hope that when we get these jobs, we don't just forget 
because we need representation because we're disproportionately represented in these rooms and it's this, 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 and, and this. <laughs> so, you know, I agree with Ron every now and then you just have to be that person, even though you don't want to be that person, but you have to be that person. Gotta be. Yep. Be the best. One thing that I know to be true just from, I mean, we have a representation issue in politics. We also have one in journalism. So one thing I know is that with being one of the onlys in their room that there, it also comes with a lot of pressure, frankly. And I wonder if any of you guys can address kind of dealing with as Mignon, as you kind of put it, be having to represent when you don't want to, but also the pressure of that if you don't speak up, there's a chance that the concerns that you're seeing, they don't, they don't get talked about. Or some of the things that, again, Ron and I were together um, in the Bush administration. So again, I was very fortunate that we, we kind of created our, our own support system, if sure. that makes sense, to make sure, you know, and I, I, again, I'm not going to say that I, that I know everything or I did everything, but there were moments when we would stop. I remember marching into his room. I'm like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> she did it more than once. <laughs> <laughs> now I just use more swear words. Uh, <laughs> But walking in and, and actually, you know, you had Jonathan Burke who worked with us, who was the first black um, chief of staff or speaker of the house uh, for, for Paul Ryan. Um, you have me Patel, you had Ron, there were a whole bunch of people, but I remember like, we kind of used to like call ball together in the afternoon. And I'm like, okay, I just need to make sure that I like, I don't want to say something that's going to be overly mean, but I'm about to get mean and we need to figure out how to fix this. And there are many times that we were able to get in there and kind of have those conversations, but my delivery all isn't always well. Um, I know that about myself. Um, and so sometimes I would usually have to go and rehearse with Ron or Jonathan or somebody else to say, do I sound mean? Okay. If I do sound mean, then I need you to go in here. Or if I don't sound mean, I'll be back with you in a couple hours and then I'd go do what I needed to do. And then I'd come back. So um, you're right. I mean, this is, it was, and you always, I always felt too, again, I, I grew up in the, in the seventies and I did this experience in the nineties and it was just, it was always so hard. Cause you didn't, I never wanted to feel like I was bigger or better than anybody else. Um, but looking back on it, we killed it. Cause we worked, I bet you we worked five times harder than everybody else. We made sure that we knew what was happening. We knew exactly where we needed to be, who to influence. Um, so we may not be up out in front doing all these things, but we got a lot of stuff done behind the scenes. And I think that's, that's where I prefer to live. Unlike um, my dear friend, Mr. Christie. Well, <laughs> let me just say this briefly. I, I, I laugh because it, you can laugh with the joy and you can laugh at the pain of the situation that we were in because we didn't have anybody else, right? There was nobody else. Mm -hmm. And my office, John and I, we always used to joke that my office was the phone booth, right? Because you could put all the black Republicans in the Bush 43 White House in my office and we'd still have plenty of space left and room on the couch. But you needed that sounding board for sanity because I always used to think, is it just me or, and then whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And John would feel the same way. Jonathan Burks would feel the same. Patel would say the same thing. And I think that helped us get through our day of not wanting to be that person. Mm -hmm. And it inspired me when I worked for the president to write the White House Chief of Staff, Andy Card, a memo called Thoughts on Black America, and really detail of you've got all these resources here. Mm -hmm. You have all these people who have unique experiences, but we're not listening to them and we're not calling upon them. And again, we didn't want to be the black person be it a Republican or Democrat administration. But once again, as my three colleagues know, oftentimes if it was us, it was nothing. And yeah. I, I felt very strongly about if I don't, no one else will. Yeah, you know, I was, um, I feel like I was lucky. I obviously work again, work for President Obama. I would work for Valerie Jarrett. Often I was not the only black person in the room. Uh, I think our, our challenge was to make sure that we weren't working in a bubble. <laughs> We yeah. weren't working silo, then we were working, again, we were working for what the community needs, not just what we think they need. Um, but my story, I do have a non-White House quick story about being the Black person in the room. Uh, it was a campaign. Uh, I'll leave the candidate's name out of it, but um, they ran for president uh, a couple years ago. And- um, I don't need to name them. <laughs> I don't know, right, right. Uh, and the candidate Thanks, was Dave. amazing, um, but, 
uh, you all remember um, the horrible racial killing of nine black people in South Carolina uh, mm -hmm. at the church a few years ago. And that happened during the campaign. And I'll never forget the morning, the next morning, um, a few of us were just not, not candy. We'll be very clear about that. A few of us were on a call and talking about what can we as a do, how do we advise the candidate? What the, should the campaign say? And a non-black person said, man, maybe we should talk about mental health. And I, to um, John's point, I lost it. I was like, mental health? <laughs> this ain't got nothing to do with mental health. This dude was racist. <laughs> and um, everyone was like, whoop. And it, I don't, I think, said candidate would have put the kibosh on that anyway and come out with the right way. But uh, it wasn't even a recommendation. And I just was like, man, if I was not, uh, there was two of us on the phone who were African-American. We were not in that call. Who knows what would have happened? Yep. Again, who just knows? Like, I hope, I think it would have got shot down, but um, we needed to call it what it was. Like mm -hmm. somebody who was did not like black people decided to murder them. And if we don't mm -hmm. call it what it is and we try to go in the sideways, we will never fix the the things that ail this country. So um, it's important in all spaces, obviously the White House, but in all spaces that sometimes you may not be comfortable, but you got to speak up. Got to do it. So I'm going to ask one more question before we kick it off to questions. And um, I want I want each of you guys to answer this one. What is something that you learned working in the White House that surprised you? I will say for me, um, I actually turned down working at the White House three times. And it was based on my own personal fear. It was not based on anything else other than fear as a young person thinking that I was inadequate, although I had credentials. But And so I turned it down three times. And it wasn't until the vice president of the United States called me. So if any young people are listening to me, don't be that stupid. That was just <laughs> me, dumb and stupid. I will tell you that. But what it taught me was, you know, you have to have, again, you got to know yourself to thy own self be true. And so I let the fear, and I bet you it was the fear of my skin color, tell me I could not do this job. And so, but when I went in there, I realized that there were no rocket scientists in the, in the White House. It is a big laboratory of great ideas. And I often say this, it is the only place in America that with the stroke of a pen, you can change someone's life. But all you have to do is to be willing to get in the game. And once I put myself in the game, I understood all you have to do, like John, uh, Jonah has said, work hard, play by the rules, outwork most of them, learn as much as you can, and then you can actually make a difference. But I was afraid to just go and try it. And then some, something went off in this ding dong head of mine and said, girl, are you crazy? Maybe it was my mother. <laughs> you know, she might have went off in that head. But that, that's what I, I learned. Don't fear, don't fear the unknown. <laughs> I had a, so my actually, my biggest surprise was after I left. And you have to remember working in the White House was my very, very first job. Oh, wow. um, we, we, we've all experienced this. So you pick up the phone and you call somebody you don't know and you say, hi, this is so-and-so, I'm from the White House. And they call back immediately. They call back really fast for everything. I don't care, it could be a policy, it could be shoes, it could be snacks, whatever. People are gonna call you back really fast. So again, this is my first job. So when I left the White House to go to a regular job um, in corporate America, I went to work for um, uh, Ceridian. And I remember making a phone call and I couldn't figure out why nobody was calling me back. That's like the big surprise <laughs> of, of my life. Um, on that, but the the one big surprise going in is how antiquated the technology in the actual office is. Um, where you think, okay, this is the White House, we're going to have the biggest, bestest, fastest stuff. Um, and you were um, again in in back in ninety one, we had one copier per floor, so you had to go take your sheet down to the copier, and you stood in line with the rest of the interns, and it might be five or six deep, um, waiting to get in line. Um, to make a copy. So again, how antiquated it was. And even when we came back, um, I had found a place where I'd made a doodle on the windowsill um, from when I was there the first time and it's still there. Um, so I went back to see if it was here. So they don't keep your house in here. <laughs> I think the one thing that you kind of know, but you don't really know until you're in it is how fast it really goes. Uh, I mean, it goes, 
you know, you think you're in there, you're like, oh, you got a term. And again, this was, a, I was in there for the second term. You're like, oh, you got a few years. You got, and then all of a sudden it's just like gone. And like, you feel like it feels like a slog. You feel like you're working on the same thing every day and trying to push a boulder up the hill. And like, then you go to bed late, you wake up early. And um, I mean, it's exhilarating and exhausting at the same time. But um, I think when you first start out, you're like, oh, we can go do a whole bunch of things. And then all of a sudden you're like, man, whoa, what time is it? Where did the, the time go? And it, um, I, you know, when you step back, like it kind of makes sense. Um, but it, 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 during when you're in it, it just feels like, you know, uh, it just goes by slow and fast at the same time. And it, if anyone does ever get a chance to serve, uh, and I encourage all of you to, to try in some form or fashion, um, but just make sure too, you take care of your own mental health uh, because it is, it's taxing uh, and you're just, it's, it is a joy and a privilege and outstanding uh, but it only will be that too if you figure out just spaces for yourself to 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 take care of yourself because um especially as a person of color um, because you do feel that extra burden um, on how to make sure that um, we're doing what we got to do um, for our people and um, it is it's taxing but it's it's exhilarating wouldn't trade it for the world and very briefly I want to echo a hundred percent of what Marlon just said because it's the most exhilarating job that you've ever had. And it's the most difficult job that you'll ever have that you can't really relate to other people and share what you do based on, is it your security clearance or what you're working on? And the best advice I ever got from John and I, our, our chief of staff was Scooter Libby. And he said, but and chair does not equate you working hard in the White House. You take care of what you need to do. And when you're finished, go home. But so many people who work in the White House think they need to be here from sundown to sunup. And that does not equate you being an efficient staffer. And the mental health aspect of it, for me, particularly after like the second year heading to my third, you know, you're working 17, 18 hours a day, five days a week. You're working 12 hours a day on Saturday. And you don't get a mental respite unless you give yourself one. And you need to recognize that the same friends and family that were there before you went in the White House, you need to make sure they're there for you during your time and after you leave. And if you get caught up in that bubble of those 18 acres, it can suck you up and eat you alive. And, and my best advice for any and all of you who are thinking about serving, not only just in the White House, but in public service, remember who you are. Remember who you are when you go in and keep that person and don't change and become some other person. Because we've all seen those other people. Folks, I'm going to pivot us into audience questions now. So I'm going to call out folks by name. It would just be helpful if folks were asking questions, if you could tell us who you are, your school and year, and where you were Zooming in from. I think our first question comes from Catherine. I was not prepared to be on video, but <laughs> hey, everybody, I'm Catherine. Um, I'm actually not a student currently, but um, I am a staff at Georgetown University. Um, and my question essentially was, uh, as a White House staffer, what did you do during your time there to essentially provide opportunities uh, for Black people or people of color to come in behind you um, as a White House staff? I think that's a great question, Catherine. I think the greatest joy and blessing that I got, similar to Marlon, was President Clinton provided an environment for me to walk down the hallways and see someone that looked like me. So it also obligated me and it gave me the freedom to hire people that look like me and to look like that look like people of color. So my team was very diverse. In fact, you know, one of the things that you worry about, I was the first political director, black political director of the White House. And so I certainly didn't want to be the last. And after that, that we've had tons. I mean, Marlon has played in this space at the highest level and we had uh, we have had others, Patrick Gaspard and others who have come behind me. And so one of the things you hope is that you're swinging the door wide open, whether they're in public service at the White House or just in government, you know, we see that today. And that's still something that I'm very passionate about making sure the young people, and I think it was Marlon or Ron that said, it, if you get an opportunity to go in, you should go in because it's nothing like it. It is simply nothing like it. And it's nothing like that that will prepare you 
once you come out, but return people's phone calls because they will forget you. <laughs> that's 100%. <laughs> I mean, that's some basic stuff. Just return the calls <laughs> with the antiquated phones. <laughs> Can I add to that? Because Mignon has been instrumental for me in my career. And I just think, I, you know, and I, I think it's probably the same uh, with uh, Ron and John and, and, and the Republicans they met or, or worked with. But um it is essential to pay it for like early on when I was just young and getting started and just ran across me. I felt like people like her and others just so like young black man trying to do me, like getting his business whoop, and wrap yeah. their arms around me <laughs> and help me to navigate the pathways uh, of being able to serve at the highest levels. And you wouldn't be there without it. So I think, you know, I, yeah, I was lucky in the white house to see a lot of folks who look like me. And I think there was a value that was there that when I left the person who took my spot was African. -American. Like that was just like a value system. So that was awesome. And the only thing I would add is when you work in the administration, but particularly you work in the white house, you have a lot of um, uh, influential power just for, by nature of working there. And so when you're working with organizations, even if they're not government organizations, um, you can influence because they, they want to be at the table and so when you were talking about your values um, of diversity, of what uh, p leadership um, and of uh, growing leaders of color, when you're talking about that um, with organizations that want to interact with the White House, that rubs off. Um, mm -hmm. And so even may not be direct, like, have you hired this person? But when it's just that values is coming out in regular conversation, you see organizations start to change. And, and we're in the middle of that movement now. I truly believe the racial reckoning that happened last summer uh, that has frankly been continuing in this country, like you are seeing organizations start to shift in how they are doing business. And we're not there yet by any means, but that is because people are using their influence and, and frankly, their resources to make those things happen and their voices. And we have to continue to do that. Yeah, well, for for me, it's always been, again, not a lot of black Republican women um, hanging out in Washington. There's a good, again, <laughs> lots that we could all probably, we're still considered a gang because there's more than three of us and we can fit into one room. But in every single, so I, kind of redirected my energy and really wanted to figure out how you not only get more black folks in, but how do you get more women in? Because mm -hmm. again, in this, in the early nineties, um, you know, telling my parents I wanted to become a lobbyist after I did this, it's kind of like, wow. Or, or becoming one and telling people like, oh, you seem like a nice girl, or you worked in the administration <laughs> for those people. Yeah. And are you sure you're okay? Or, you know, what happened? But for me, it's constantly telling the story, constantly that there's a place for you, um, it, either Democrat or Republican administrations, there is a place for you. And I, I firmly believe that you, everybody should take this chance um, to serve a sitting president. I, I think it's one of the greatest honors um, ever. And so is if, if there are ways, I always made sure it, that if I see somebody that looks like me, that's remotely interested in going in, I'm like, I'm gonna tell you exactly what to expect. This is what you need to do. Um, and regardless, again, of administration, because I had some friends who were like, I know you worked in the, you know, the other administration, but when Clinton came in, it was, well, how do I do this? And I was like, make sure that you understand how every single division works. Yep. Um, so if that question comes up, you're the first one to raise your hand um, and really try to provide a support system more for folks um, and point them in the right direction. Um, you know, because you once you, all we have to do is open the door. It's up to you once you get in there. The only thing I'd say is one of my favorite board games when I was a kid was called Shoots and Ladders. And I always made sure to put the ladder down after I'd got to a certain level to make sure that others could climb up it after me. And there's so many people in this town who forget that, that they've made it and they don't care. You've got to put the ladder down. You've got to let others climb up. And Jonna mentioned him. I mean, I hired Jonathan Burks to work for me. And I didn't hire him because he was super young. I didn't hire him because he was black. I hired him because he was smart but I hired him because I recognized here's an opportunity who we can bring somebody in who's very well qualified, who's smart, who also happens to be a person of color. And we did. And I'm thrilled to see my star student, Hannah, down there in the queue. <laughs> yeah, Hannah has our next question. Go ahead, Hannah. 
All right, thank you so much um, for being here. This is a great discussion. Uh, my name is Hannah Spangler and I'm a graduate student in the McCourt School. And I am currently zooming in from Toledo, Ohio, which might be the case a little longer since Professor Christie said we will be on Zoom again. Uh, <laughs> but my question is, in today's climate, being a white ally has become somewhat of a buzzword and can oftentimes lead to performative allyship which can not only enforce the status quo, but can at times be more detrimental dis to dismantling systems rooted in white supremacy. What genuine and authentic ways can white people and people of privilege do to, to support the BIPOC community in both the White House and in the greater political policy sphere at large? Well, let me take the prerogative since Hannah's one of my favorite students in my class this semester and say this, I, I think that one of the biggest things in this cancel culture climate that we live in is that people are petrified of being honest and they're petrified of speaking their mind. If you aren't of color and you have an opinion, you should feel confident to say what you think, mean what you say and say what you mean without the fear of being cultured for some politically correct, whatever that might be. And I think once we stop dancing around each other and being careful to engage in free and full speech, I think that gets us on a path where we can actually have more honest conversations as opposed to being afraid of saying something that will offend someone. I'll chime in too. Um, I'll just tell a personal story that I hope it gets to your question. Uh, my wife is Caucasian. I have biracial twin daughters. They're three years old. Uh, they run the household, FYI. Um, and, um, my wife has a very large extended family. Easter's is her big holidays, like hundred people, all Caucasian, et cetera. Uh, I'm the only African-American in the, you know, in that side of the family and I've always been welcome. Um, I think some of them, we don't see eye to eye politically, but there's never, you know, it's all family. I bring this up because when, um, the killing of Ahmaud uh, Arbery happened last year, um, we moved to Denver about 18 months ago. Part of it was um, we wanted to get closer to the family with kids. Uh, and I've been trying to take advantage of the Denver post White House life of running, getting in shape, all the things um, I did not do in DC. Um, <laughs> and I'll never forget, I was strapping up, like this is probably a week or two after the, the, the murder had happened. I was strapping up my shoes and it was like late because we had just got the kids down. And so it was like 7.30, 8 o'clock, and I was going to go for a quick job. And she was like, I don't, I don't, I don't actually feel comfortable with you you doing that. Um, and, you know, we had to talk about it. And, like, I mean, I have my own reservations when I get ready to do it, but I kind of get through it, and I say, I'm going to go, because I'm, you know, if that's if, – I'm not going to let you stop me from enjoying nature, um, you know. Uh, and we had to talk about it. I just appreciated her – having that conversation with me. And that just led to a larger kind of family conversation about race. And we've talked about race as a biracial couple, but it led to like a deeper one, which then encouraged her to one, do her own research and listen and listen to my experiences and listen to a lot of my friends' experiences. Uh, but then two, she got in touch with that said hundred person family and just told them the story I just told you. And as when and this is after George Floyd, she was like, I just want you to know the kind of conversation I had, I had with my husband that you don't have every day in your family. Um, and I just want you to sit with that and think about what we can do and how we can listen. And I just want to emphasize that word. Um, as white allies, I think listening to people's lived experiences, um, I think is going to be really important and vice versa. We should also listen to, you know, white people's experiences as well too, right? Um, but I, you know, too many times we all try to come up with like, all right, well, if we just do this, we can fix the systems. And I'm not saying we can't, we shouldn't move forward. We have to move forward with making solutions because people's lives depend on it. But we also need to listen so we understand so those solutions are baked in like people's um, lived experiences and not just us making assumptions. And so I appreciate her for listening uh, and then for sharing that story with her family and taking it out of the social media context, which is a disaster in my opinion, um, mm -hmm. and actually just having a family conversation. Because when family members are talking to each other, 
I, that's that's completely. If they if I wasn't a family member with those folks, who knows what the conversation would have been? But because they now have a black cousin, a black you know nephew in law, whatever, it just changed it. And it, she got a lot of responses back and did some Zoom calls with her white cousins and stuff like that. And you know that's the only way we're gonna move forward. You know, I and I would just add, and I agree with both Ron and Marlon. Um, Hannah, there's a, we, we're almost living in almost somewhat of a time capsule. I think if we look back to May 25th and we look at those eight minutes and 46 seconds where we witness a man being murdered on national TV, something about that image changed how we looked at each other and how we wanted to relate to each other. Now, you could have been a different person pre-George Floyd, or you could have been the same person. And what I try to say to people, whoever you are, be intentional about being true to that person. You don't have to, you know, I found a lot of my clients, I found a lot of my friends, white, white, those folks that I had had relationships with, that we could talk about race and we could talk about things that were just, you know, fun and different, they got incredibly nervous about being who they were. And at some point you almost have to give them a way. We have to give white people permission to be who they are, because I'd rather know who you are than to try to figure it out and see if we can kind of help educate each other. Or you have to have the courage of who you believe that you have come to be and just be who you are and just hope that your your black allies and your friends, your the people of color that you deal with, understand that Hannah has not changed, the world changed, but how can we make a difference? And I always just say to people, post George Floyd, we all have an obligation, we all have a responsibility to make this world different and to make it better for Marlins two young ones who are not coming into this world looking at us like we're black, white, or brown. They're coming into this world saying, I, he wants his children to have the same opportunities I want my nieces and nephews to have. And I suspect if you ha have children one day, the same thing will happen. And that's all we, we want to level playing field. We don't need you to be extra. And I think sometimes social media makes you extra. You don't have yeah. to be, just be, be Hannah. The fact that you can ask this question in an open forum tells me right there, yep. you have the sensitivity and the compassion that we need going forward. I, I agree with you 100%, um, just because again, I'd, I'd rather have that co courageous conversation with you than for, cause again, after some, so I'm married to a white guy as well. Um, and I've got teenagers, I've got a son and a daughter and trying to help them navigate um, what happened and having those conversations. Um, mm -hmm. And we live in Nebraska now. So we moved from Washington, DC, which is all they've ever known to two years ago or 18 months ago, moving to Nebraska. And what a culture shock for both of them mm -hmm. um, because there, are, there aren't a lot of kids um, that look like me. Um, they found a few that look like them, um, but really trying to, for them trying to have that conversation with their friends was really difficult. And sometimes, and a lot of the friends were kind of like, Hey, I want to tell you what I think or how I feel. And they're, they're like, wait a minute, I'm, just, I'm, I'm trying to process with the rest of America. So I need you to step off a little bit. Give me some time to think about how I feel about this. Then I'll help you figure, go get through your thing. But for now, this is, this is, I got to deal with what I'm feeling. So again, I, I'm glad you asked the question. That's great. It's a really thoughtful question. Um, we're about at time, but we want to squeeze in one more question. Um, this one's coming from Jenny Patterson. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jenny Patterson. I'm a second year MPP student at the court. Um, and I'm zooming in from North Miami Beach, Florida. And my question is for our Republican panelists. Um, as a Black Republican, did you feel comfortable advocating for policies designed to benefit Black people? And did you advocate for such policies? Jonna? Well, so I'm going to start off as I am the evil woman who worked on welfare reform <laughs> um, on the House Ways and Means Committee. So I don't know if if at the time with the 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 information and the way that we were going as Republicans, um, you know, the re and so I am responsible for the revocation of driver's licenses um, um, in that bill. And so I don't know if it was again, you have to remember, it was a different time. There wasn't this type of um, this just 
awful, like politics has just gotten bad over the past 15 years. Like it's just, people are not nice anymore. Um, we used to be able to have these conversations with our friends on the other side of the aisle. And that's how we got to know them was by talking to them, by disagreeing with them, by having these courageous conversations, like you guys are hurting this community. And for me being able to ask the questions, what does this do? How is this going to impact communities of color? And I will say, I remember being a meeting when I was on the Hill asking that question and somebody pulling out the stats, well, this is actually gonna impact, you know, white communities more than black communities. And I remember sitting there like, I'm not really sure. And then calling somebody that I was comfortable with, like, tell me how this is really gonna work. Um, but I don't know if we, that was never, again, I'm being honest, that, that was never our um, focus. Our focus was to do a good job for this entire country. Um, so I, I, I feel bad for having that answer, but that's just, that was the time that we were in. Um, back in the nineties, trying to, you know, create policies that we thought were going to help all Americans, um, be successful and, and, and get out of poverty. And, and let me echo Jonna's comment because while she was working for the evil ways and means committee for welfare reform, I was working for the evil budget committee. Yeah. And <laughs> it's so strange because I didn't look at this of like, oh, it's welfare reform. We're going to hurt all these black people. I knew statistically for being a budget geek that there are more people who are Caucasian. Who were in those programs than yes. black people. And, than black people. So I didn't look at it like, oh, I'm going to go out and try to hurt people of color. I thought if we can find a way to end the dependency, to end this sort of never ending cycle of payment to payment to this, to that, to housing, and we can get people self-sufficient and go back to work, that will decrease the roles of people on welfare. They'll get back to work. They will lead productive lives, and it will be a boon for the federal government. But I, I, think Mar I think that Marshall is, again, we look where Marshall is in, during the Obama years. I mean, they, there was a lot of, you know, he was the first black president. Um, and there was a lot of pressure on them that first year to figure out what you're going to do for communities of color. We didn't have that pressure. No. Um, and, and so to me, it's, it's kind of like comparing apples to oranges because of the, again, we were going with what was happening at that, at that time. And not to speak for Marlon, but I mean, I have to imagine every single day, everyone's like, well, you're the first black president. Well, you're the first black president. Are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? Well, you're the first black president that like, he just wanted to be president. And then actually when we worked on ways and means in the budget committee, um, uh, Minion, you know, the Clinton folks were absolutely wonderful to work with. hundred yeah, percent. I mean, it was really nice to be able to go to a meeting and again, coming out of the first Bush, which was a crazy campaign to be able to sit down in a room with people and have these conversations. I'm not going to lie. I got a lot of crazy looks um, when I'd go over to the white house to go <laughs> to a meeting and they're like, hi, now who are you? And I, my, and I'd say my name and so you work for them? And I was like, I do. I mean, are you in the right meeting? Are you, are you sure you're supposed to be here? <laughs> um, but like, I, I enjoyed like the, in those days, it was really great to be able to work with your colleagues across the aisle. There wasn't this fear of this, these games of I got you or I hate you. And then not only do I hate you, I hate your family. I want to see you dead. Um, like it's just gotten out of, it's out of control. Um, and so I think after, when, you know, after um, when Obama came in, I think that's when things really got tough. I think that's when we had these national, you know, these bigger conversations around, um, you know, around race. You know, Trump was, again, it, it, that was a little bit difficult. Did you um, have to mention him? Us. Pardon me? You had to mention him? Sorry. I, full disclosure, I worked, I worked on the inauguration. I can't, I'm not even going to pretend it, it. I did that. That was my duty for the cause and it's over. But, um, but now it's, I just think it's so much harder because again, you have some, a group of people who are afraid to speak up. And then you have another group of people who don't want to say the wrong thing and weaponize whatever is happening around you. So I think it's now, I think it's just, it's, it's, we're in tough times right now. Like it's up to these students to write the ship. <laughs> yes. It's your responsibility. You have to pick up the baton. Godspeed. <laughs> really quickly before we close, um, Mignon and Marlon, was there anything else you wanted to add? Since I know I've kept you guys over time, unsurprisingly. 
Well, I think for, for us during the tough times of like welfare reform and all of those, we were really looking at that policy and making sure that we weren't destroying the safety net. And, you know, we had just come through a rough period where the welfare queen was labeled a black woman. And so, you know, there were all, all of these images and things that we really had to think about and really deconstruct in order to even get where Ron and, and Jonah were talking about. I mean, because, you know, we were disproportionately targeted, even though we weren't the we weren't you know, we weren't the majority on welfare reform. It gave the impression that we were. Yep. So, you know, so the safety net was coming from out from under us, but yet we couldn't, you know, we didn't have the jobs. We were disproportionately impacted. But in the end, I mean, I think we all fight on fair lines, but like Jonah said, you at least could talk and you could, mm -hmm. you, you could reason together, which was important. I mean, God knows it's even more important now. <sighs> Big time. I'll, I'll close by saying, I think I've probably become more friends with like moderate Republicans these last four years who are dissatisfied with the tone and tenor mm -hmm. of our political system than I was beforehand. And what this made me respect was like, many of them, not all, but many of them have the same outcome in mind that I do. Yeah. Their approach may be different. Mm -hmm. You know, Ron and John's approach may be different than mine and many others, but like we have the same outcome. So let's just sit down and talk. So we can figure out is there a way can we blend approaches or you know why do you think this way why do you think that way, and so all of you listening today I guess here's a couple of pieces of advice one, don't have the conversation on Twitter. Um, <laughs> I appreciate that you're ha that you're in this space now because you can have real discussion without fear of like someone's gonna tweet you or out you or uh, yeah. it's just like keep doing the stuff like this, don't do it on Twitter. Um, get off your Facebook algorithm because it's also bad if you as an individual are in your own bubble reinforce constantly and try to understand the other side and why they may approach it in certain ways. And, and let's just get rid of the vitriol. And so I, I just think it, I agree. It starts like Ryan said, I have to put it on you guys, but it's up to you um, to get us back because um, I, I'm just social media piece of this to me has just really um, corrupted politics and, and, it's, not, it, it's fixable, but it will take us to do that. Yep, I agree, 100. 100. All right, folks, with Marlon's words of wisdom, we are unfortunately going to have to leave it there. Thank you to Jana, Ron, Mignon, and Marlon, and of course, GU Politics for having me back. And folks, I, I hope you have a good, um, good rest of your evening. Stay safe and stay healthy.